My name is Vanessa Ventola. I'm an outreach coordinator at Green Thumb, the division of the NYC Parks Department that works with community gardens across the city. Again, I just want to say that we appreciate everyone tuning into the Green Thumb Grow Together conference. Green Thumb is so grateful for everything you're doing to keep our community gardens safe and healthy, and we hope you and your loved ones are safe as well. Uh, we're so thrilled to have people joining us today from all over the world. I want to introduce our Q&A host today, who is Venus. Uh, tech support I mentioned is Ariana. And now I would like to introduce our facilitators. Uh, Laura and Chantel join us from Grow NYC Education. Their mission is to inspire, promote, and facilitate the creation of sustainable learning gardens at all Department of Education, K through 12 public and charter schools. So I'm gonna turn, them, turn it over to them um, and thanks so much. Awesome, thank you, Vanessa. Um, so yes, I'm Laura Casarigola. I'm a school gardens coordinator with Grow NYC School Gardens. Um, <laughs> joining me today might be my cat if you hear any meowing and also um, Chantel Kemp. Do you wanna introduce yourself while I share my screen here? Yes, so uh, my name is Chantel Kemp. I am also a garden coordinator at Grow NYC and jealous that Laura has a cat. Um, <laughs> I'm super excited to be um, here with you all today. Um, oh, and I wanted to share my farm, my uh, garden name before we get started. All the kids call me Farmer Shan. Uh, do they call you anything, Laura? No, I don't have a fun nickname. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, all right, so can everyone see the presentation okay? Mm -hmm. You're good to go. Great. Um, and as they said, feel free to ask questions throughout in the chat and we will save like 10 to 15 minutes at the end so we can get more into depth if there's anything you're more curious about or if you have additional questions. So today we're just gonna go over some fun ways that you can grow a garden from food scraps. Okay. And if this workshop interests you or you wanna look for more um, activities to do at home with people of all ages, we have a distance learning site called growNYCdistancelearning.org that has a lot more resources on there. Yeah, so um, this is a little slide talking about who we are, GrowNYC, um, and I think Vanessa did a good job talking about school gardens and, and what our mission is. Um, but GrowNYC as a whole, we protect the environment, create green spaces, help people stay healthy, and give them the opportunity to make a positive impact. All right, so getting into the actual workshop now, if you have any of these items that is on this list at home, you can actually start growing from your food scraps or just from pantry items that you may never have thought of before. So I won't read out every single thing on this list, but we're gonna go over a few of them into more depth today. Some really fun ones that I think people don't always think about are things like ginger, if you have the little root or rhizome piece, um, if you have dried beans, pineapple tops, you can regrow those and actually make a tea out of the green parts of pineapples, which I never knew before we researched this workshop. Um, there's a lot of different things. And the more I've experimented with growing from food scraps, the more I realize that my pantry and my refrigerator are bursting with life. Uh, so let's go into more depth on fruit seeds to begin with. So when we're thinking about what a botanical fruit is, it's going to be, it's a little different than maybe what you consider a culinary fruit and vegetable. So when we're talking botanically in terms of the way that these plants grow, um, a botanical fruit is anything that develops from the flower of a plant and contains seeds inside. So the more common fruits that we think of uh, normally would be like apples, pears, things like that. Um, oranges, um, but also if we're talking about gardening or botanical use, um, peppers are actually a fruit because it, there's a plant, there's a flower, out of the flower comes the fruit or the, the thing that yeah. holds the seeds, and then the seeds are inside. And so that's actually the same thing with eggplants, tomatoes, which is the one that kids always love being like, oh, did you know tomatoes are a fruit? They're not a vegetable. Um, and even squash. So pumpkins technically are botanical fruits. 
Yeah, I think I was getting away with the tomato one, like, you know, for the kids, explaining to them that that's a fruit, but I might, I think the eggplant might be a little bit harder to convince them. <laughs> and th these are, you know, if you're talking botanically, if I were a chef and I was saying the culinary definition, I would consider eggplants to be vegetables because that's how you use them in the culinary sense. But here today, we're going to take the garden perspective. Um, so germinating seeds is um, the process by which an organism grows from a seed. So what we're going to try to encourage you to try out today is germinating different types of fruit seeds that you already have in your homes. Um, and a basic way to help germinate your seeds is to soak them in wet paper towels for about a day before planting them, and that will soften the husk of the seed, the shell on the outside, which will make it easier for the little sprout, the little radical to pop out of the seed. Yeah, this the, the germination part is so cool. It's such a great activity to do with kids, to teach them about, you know, the different stuff that you might have in the house and how you can grow stuff. Um, just don't be alarmed if you like try to germinate a seed and it doesn't grow because seeds are kind of finicky like that. Yeah, these are all experimental. <laughs> So one of the first experiments that I actually did in quarantine um, when we were all looking for hobbies and things to take our minds off the outside world is I decided to try and grow a lemon tree from uh, a lemon that I got just from the grocery store. And I had never tried this before. I had no idea if the seeds were viable or if it was some weird GMO lemon. But I thought, what the heck, I'm stuck at home. I have a pot, I have soil. and what I wanted to do, since I wasn't sure if these seeds were even viable, is first I did that germination with water, um, a wet paper towel in a Tupperware. I didn't make it, I, I kind of wrung out the paper towel so that it was like the consistency of a sponge because you don't want, if you put too much water, it'll get moldy. Um, so then I waited a few days actually, and that's when I started to see on this picture on the left, a little sprout coming out, the little radical coming out of out of the lemon seed. So I decided to plant that one. Um, and with lemon seeds, with citrus, it's always good to do more of like a lighter, sandy mix of soil if you have it. I didn't have that and I wasn't gonna go to the store. So I just used regular soil I had laying around. Um, so I took it, the one that looked the most promising and I put it in my little pot. And this is it 10 months later. I took this picture yesterday. <laughs> so it did grow and it was pretty successful. Um, I'm not expecting to get any lemons out of it because we don't live in a tropical enough climate. My apartment is not humid enough. It would need full, full sun and it doesn't totally get that where I am. If you are interested in growing citrus in your apartment in New York City or in your house that will actually produce fruit. There are a few dwarf varieties of citrus that you can get from a nursery that will do that. But this is just a lovely houseplant and a fun experiment. It certainly is. And I, I wonder if anybody is willing to do a lime one and then we could compare your lemon and your lime trees. Yeah, that's true. I don't see as many seeds in limes though. So that's why I never tried it. They're like a lot smaller. They don't look as promising to me, but mm -hmm. that could be my next experiment. All right, another tropical fruit seed that you can grow is an avocado pit. And for this one, it's a bit of a different process because we're working with this gigantic seed and you want to make sure that you clean off all of the actual avocado meat from the pit because that'll just get moldy and pretty gross. And then you want to stick toothpicks in it so that you can suspend it with the rounder, fatter half of the pit below the water, um, and then you'll have the other half dry. And you have to be a bit more patient with these ones. It can take a month or two until you start to see this picture on the left where the root will grow down towards the bottom. Another few weeks or months later, you'll start to see this next picture where the stem will actually come up. And then about a year later, you could have an avocado tree Again, these ones aren't going to produce avocados because we don't have exactly the conditions that these tropical plants love, but it is a way to use these, this avocado pit, which you might have just 
thrown away or composted um, and you can grow a beautiful house plant with a fun mm -hmm. story. <laughs> Yeah, and just for just don't forget to remember to change the water. Um, some people don't change the water, and then it molds and it gets gross, and they're like, "Oh, it's the avocado!" Like, yeah, that's true for all of this stuff that we're going to tell you. With but if there's ever a glass of water involved, change it out every few days at least, um, and that also will help provide. I think something about the oxygen levels in the water will also be better for the plants. Nice. Um, and we also do have additional blog posts um, on the distance learning page talking all about how to grow avocado pits and avocado plants in your home. So feel free to check that out if you want more information. Mm -hmm. More of a step-by-step -step guide. So with seed saving, it can be whatever you want to try out. So um, here's an example of something you would normally just throw away or discard as well. And it's a red bell pepper, which you can brush the seeds off of it, um, dry them out on a paper towel or coffee filter, and uh, then see once they dry out after a few days, you'll know if you test one out and you um, try to break it in half if it cracks, that means that it's dry enough and you can put it stored in a paper bag, um, not a plastic one because you want to reduce the amount of humidity that gets to it. And what we learned is that these types of seeds that you save um, can last up to three years and still be viable. And speaking of seed viability, um, so that just means what are the chances that this seed will actually produce something? Um, so some things to consider is you want something that is an heirloom fruit um, and organic if possible, unless you want to really like go wild and experiment. But if you're hoping to really get something out of it, um, heirloom is great because that means that those seeds have been passed down um, and they've successfully produced the same types of fruits as the parent stock. So that's why you want to look for heirloom things. Organic is also good because that means it's not genetically modified um, in the modern sense of it. So a lot of genetically modified or some of it um, produce is not meant to reproduce. And so it either doesn't have seeds at all or the seeds there are sterile and they, they won't sprout into anything. It's also good to look for locally grown produce. So the pictures I have here are heirloom tomatoes and heirloom dried beans from the green markets around here in New York City. And that's a good sign and bodes well for your experiments because it means that they were grown in the same climate so if you wanted to grow, if you wanted new tomatoes for your community garden and you really like these ones at the green market, you can take those seeds and know that it works well in this New York City climate USDA zone 7B. Um, it's also something to keep in mind is what is the maturity level of your fruit? For example, back to the pepper, you can see that we harvested the seeds from a red pepper as opposed to a green pepper because the red pepper is the mature form of the, veg or of the fruit. So that means the seeds are mature. And that can change. You might want to Google each fruit that you're thinking of doing because each of them reaches the correct stage of maturity to harvest the seeds at a different point. For example, cucumbers that you buy from the store do not have mature seeds inside of them. In order to harvest cucumber seeds, you have to grow the cucumber, wait for it, to go way past its prime, turns yellow and mushy, and that means that your seeds are ready to harvest. So it depends which kind of fruit you want to grow. Um, and then the one last consideration that you, that you can consider is uh, dried seeds versus fresh seeds. For the avocado and for the lemon seeds, those were fresh. I didn't do anything special to them. I just ate the thing and then planted the seed immediately. But with the pepper seeds, they do need to be dried first in order to produce. Um, so also um, the tomato seeds as well, they need to be fermented. <laughs> like, it's, it's like a whole process. 
Um, so like definitely like do research um, when you're thinking about different um, seed saving techniques that you want to use for different fruits or, or different vegetables. Um, and, and don't try to take it all on, on your own. Like try to work with a team for that because the different vegetables and the different maturity rates, it could get a little overwhelming after a while. Yeah, this is seed saving is an entire field of study. Um, so we can't go into each one today, but it is a good place to start. All right, Chantel, you want to start us off with root veggies? Yes, so we're going to talk all about some root veggies, and I'm super excited, especially to talk about garlic. I love garlic. Um, garlic is used so much, um, especially like in the African-American community, as like the heal all. Um, you sick? Eat some garlic. You know, so well, eat some garlic. Um, so garlic, um, as far as like regrowing, it has the potential to grow one little clove has the potential to grow an entire bulb. So that's very economical. Um, it does take eight to 10 months to reach maturity, which is why most people use garlic as a cover crop. Um, the other the great thing about garlic is you can eat these little uh, scapes that's right here after a few weeks. And it's actually a really great culinary delicacy. Um, people go to specialty markets to buy garlic scapes all the time and pay a lot of money for it and you get it for free. Um, and you can grow it indoors and outdoors, and it contains a whole bunch of like magnesium, vitamins, uh, fiber, calcium, copper, a whole bunch of things that are really great for you. So next slide. Uh, next slide. Yes. Uh, and so here is a really great example of how you can grow garlic both indoors and outdoors. And so for this indoor pot, you should use um, a pot that's about eight to 10 inches deep. So not like a super big pot, you know. Um, and then if you want to have the garlic scapes like we talked about, you want to plant the garlic a little bit closer together. But if you don't want the garlic scapes and you only really care about the bulbs, then you could plant them a little farther apart. Um, and then for outdoors, you always plant them in the rows and you always plant it with this pointy side pointing right side up because that's where the, the stem is going to come from and you don't want it to have to do this little circle around just to come back up. Um, so yeah, those are just some really quick tips as far as like how to grow garlic indoors and then also grow garlic outdoors. And then now we're going to get into another great root veggie, which is potatoes. And I love potatoes because you can do so many things with it and there's so many varieties. Um, so potatoes, you just cut them into pieces. So we have this really great potato that's right here and it has the eyes, that's what they call them, or the sprouts. And I'm sure a number of us have seen this. Um, in our refrigerators when we leave the potatoes there for too long or in the cabinet. So you just uh, cut it into pieces um, so that each piece of the potato has an eye and then you have to dry it out for like 24 hours and then after that you can just plant them. And you can also grow potatoes at home as long as you have like a relatively large container, so maybe like a milk crate. Um, I even seen people who had these uh, bags that they just put on the windows and they filled it up with soil and grew potatoes in a bag. And I was like, wow, that's ingenious. Um, <laughs> like on a burlap sack, like on a fence or a window or something like that. And then also potatoes are not like really picky about the soil. So it's like, it doesn't really matter if it's sandy or loony. Um, they'll, they'll pretty much grow in, in whatever environment. You just have to make sure that it has a lot of sun um, and that you, um, when the potatoes are regrowing, when you start seeing the plants come up, just bury it again to get more potatoes. Great tip. All and, right. and we have ginger as well. And this process of growing ginger, you can do it indoors here in New York City. Uh, there is a process. I don't think we have time to go into it all in this workshop, um, but we do have a more in-depth growing guide on how you can grow ginger indoors in New York City. And you, this is another one that takes a little patience. So it can take eight to 10 months um, for it to reach maturity. The first month or two, you won't see anything happening. 
Um, we grew these in our office. This is the picture on the right here is in the Grow NYC office. And we put them in when we were just using, just starting it off with the little ginger rhizome. We put it underground in the milk crates and put it in our storage closet because that was the warmest little space we had. And I think it took one to two months to even see a sprout come above the surface. But you can harvest it technically after four months and it'll be a little less strong ginger taste, um, a little more delicate, or you can wait the eight to 10 months. You can even keep these going for a few years. The ones we have here, I think are three years old and then we harvested them, had a big office party with ginger tea. <laughs> Laura, Chantel, we have a really good question. Um, since you've just talked about all these indoor plants um, or these, these uh, seedlings being grown indoors, the question is, how much sun would you recommend and what direction uh, should the window be facing and would a grow light or lamp suffice in all these situations that you've mentioned? Um, I, the sun, the sun, varies from crop to crop as far as how much sun it would need and and i, I don't want to speculate um you could look all of that up as far as like how much sun the specific vegetable would need and then you could also look up what direction your window is if you're going on a windowsill to see if that is the direction that is going to get full sun or the most sun as possible um so i think it just it all depends on whatever whatever you're trying to grow and what space you're trying to grow it in most of the ones we've shown, I would say full sun. So you wanna get it at least six, full sun is six to eight hours of direct sun. And that's pretty unlikely to get that in New York City. Um, my lemon plant is doing okay and I only get four or five hours of sun. The more sun you have, the better these tropical plants are gonna do. Even, um, yeah, I think you can also, you look for your south facing window in our part of the world, that's the one that will get the light for the longest time. But that can depend if you have a building blocking your south basic window, it might not be your best option. Um, and the grow lights, do you wanna talk about? The yeah, the grow lights can definitely help. They can add a lot, they can add supplemental light. Usually the kind that we use for home use are not powerful enough to grow, to be the single source of light unless you get a super expensive one. And for something like a large ginger plant, you would need a really big grow light. Um, but for the other types of plants that are a bit smaller, you can add a grow light above it and that'll help supplement the amount of light you have and make it much more feasible to grow some of this stuff. So that was a great question. All right, we're going to pivot a little and now talk about growing a garden in water in your own house. So I actually brought out my scallions from my fridge before this workshop. And as you can see, they're so long that I actually need to make sure I eat them um, soon because they don't fit in my fridge anymore. But you can regrow your scallion greens. It has to be the type of scallions that have the roots on them already, the white part. And then you would just put them in a jar of water. Um, you can eat the greens, but save at least a couple inches at the bottom of the white part. And it'll grow back inside your fridge and you can grow it back about five times. And so this is a great way to make fewer trips to the grocery store, save a little money, always have a fresh garnish um, for your food at home. And this process of just putting vegetables in water can actually work for a bunch of different things like leeks. You have a head of lettuce that does still have the roots on it, which some places sell it like that. It can work if you eat a carrot and you save the top part of it and put it in water. You can regrow beet greens if you save the tops. It works with celery and it'll grow the celery leaves, which are actually kind of like an herb you can use in place of parsley. Um, and even pineapple tops, that one I haven't tried personally. <laughs> but this is a, a picture of someone's little garden that they're growing from all this stuff that you might have just 
discarded if you didn't know. Um, and I feel like a lot of this stuff starts growing even when I don't intend to grow it. I'll open up my onion container and it'll have sprouts coming out of it. <laughs> Laura, we have a pretty, we have a good question or follow up. How often uh, would you recommend changing the water? Um, I would say every couple of days. Um, I do forget though, and I'll do it once a week and it's fine. It gets a little like the roots will get a little gross. <laughs> so I think every couple of days, if you can get into the habit, it'll work best. All right, and then what we also have here is how to grow your own sprouts at home, which is really easy, really fast. And I'll actually show you what I have here because I have one going um, in my windowsill right now. So what I have here is these chia seeds, which I just got from the store. It's like one of those huge bulk bags that I've had for over a year. I don't know how I'm ever gonna eat my way through this in yogurt and smoothies. So I've decided during quarantine to just start growing my own sprouts. And so all I did is I rummaged through my recycle container and brought out this upcycled container. And I kept the top as well because it's clear. And I figured it could act as like a mini greenhouse. I did poke a few holes in the top so that some air circulation could still get in. But I put um, some paper towels in the bottom and then I spritzed it with some water so it was nice and damp. And then I just sprinkled a whole bunch of seeds in there. You can see, you can go pretty dense the way that you put them in there. And I did this on Tuesday during a different workshop and these are already sprouting and it's only been two days. So in the summer, I found I would have sprouts ready to harvest in just a week. Now during winter, because the sun is not quite as strong, it takes two weeks, but that's still not too shabby. Nice. And do you just throw them like in a salad or something? Yeah, I know. you can use them on top of salads. Um, I put them in sandwiches. Uh, you can put them in smoothies if you want. It's like a very fresh, nice taste. Um, and you can also, using a similar method, like, you know, the upcycled container, um, you can grow microgreens, but for that, I would recommend using soil, not just a paper towel, because their microgreens will actually have like a full on leaf. So they need a bit more of a root system. Great. Cool, so those were, those were um, our tips and tricks for how to regrow things from your food scraps or things that you just have laying around in your pantry or fridge. And next we're gonna go into what do these food scraps have to do with our food system? Right, so we've explored a lot about uh, food and, and how to regrow food and what to do with it. Um, and I just, wanted to, I just wanted us to talk a little bit about the food that is just in our system that's available to us and what we can do to divert some of the food waste that's happening. Um, so a great way is regrowing your food scraps and then I'm gonna talk to you about some other things that you can do. And so the food system is essentially just the connection between producers who are the people who make the food, the transportation, um, people who deliver all of our food, um, the people who sell our food, us, the consumers, which is everybody um, within the system, and then the waste management of food. So that is the entire food system. And in the next slide, I have a really great picture that just visualizes what all of that looks like. Um, and I think this picture is really great because it brings up something that we don't normally talk about in the food system, which is uh, social influences and political influences and our environmental influences and our economic influences. They all affect um, our food system and just also our relationship to food. And so we have some really great facts about the food system, some things that you may know and some things that you might not. So this fact I thought was really crazy that our food travels on average 1500 miles to get to our plates. Um, what do you think about it, Laura? Um, so yeah, it is pretty wild that it travels this far. 
Um, yeah, and it, it, the sad part about it is that it's such a major practice um, in our food system. And it's a lot, it's a reason that we have a lot of poor health and climate change issues. And so um, another part of the climate change issue is also industrial agriculture. Um, and so, you know, industrial agriculture emits a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of carbon emissions, and it also has a lot of chemicals, and it just puts a lot of strain on our environment as a whole. And the way that climate change is set up at this point, if there are any major disruptions within the food system, it could lead to massive food insecurity. Um, and as we've seen, climate change is real and it is happening today and it is affecting us. So one of the things that we can do is to support our local food systems. So in the next slide, we talk about what is a local food system. And it, a local food system is basically um, one that shortens the distance between the food producers and consumers, both literally and figuratively. So instead of you going to the supermarket and picking up a whole bunch of produce that you don't really know where it came from, or who grew it, you actually have a connection with your farmer, you actually have a connection with the person that is selling to you, and you actually have a better understanding of where all your food is coming from. Another great thing, another um, fun fact that I actually just learned about our food system um, is in the next slide. <laughs> and it's all about how most of the brands that we eat and we consume are actually owned by a small number of companies. And this term is referred to as big food. And so when we think about it like that, you know, it's a lot better to shop with someone who you know and you know what they're doing with your food than to shop from one of these reputable brands or brands that we know or we think are reputable because they've been marketing to us all this time. <laughs> so that's why we think that. Um, and so uh, some of the things that we can do for that, like I was talking about, is like supporting our local food systems. And so in the next slide, we have a whole bunch of examples of what a local food system is and what it looks like and that's community gardens, it could be farmers markets, food co-ops, uh, CSA, and plus a whole number of other programs and initiatives and organizations. Um, these just really just shorten everything. It just makes it so much easier for you to understand uh, your relationship to food, what your farmer is doing, what's going into your food, and, and you know, be able to make informed decisions about what you're feeding yourself and also your family. Yeah, I, I love seeing these examples. And I know our audience today is uh, mostly community gardeners. And I feel like whenever I talk to people in our, in our line of work with school gardeners and also with community gardeners, a lot, of, a lot of us are saying the same things of how good it feels to be able to take back a little bit of the power of the food system and be growing our own things. Um, and when yeah. you think about that number of food traveling on average 1,500 miles, um, it, it really closes the gap if we can grow a little bit um, right here at home. Yes. Laura um, Chantel, we had a question um, which I thought was, was pretty um, interesting. Um, so winter is, is obviously challenging. And so the question is, how do we shorten the food system in the winter when farmers markets um, are closed? Um, and then some of the suggestions um, were joining a CSA, which could sometimes be prohibitive, cost prohibitive, they're expensive. So do you have any suggestions um, for how to do this in the winter time specifically? Um, I think because of climate change, a lot more community gardeners are doing more season extension um, I think so. I mean, they, they have been doing it. I've seen, I've seen uh, small gardeners uh, around where I live now who have stuff that are growing and are harvesting from their gardens even right now um, and even during the whole, you know, snowstorm thing that was going on. Um, so I think, you know, being more engaged in what's going on in the community gardens that are near you and um, really encouraging them to continue to do uh, 
season extension, as well as being connected to gardens that have greenhouses, because they're also more likely to do season extension. And you probably could get produce from them um, more cheaper and more affordable than going to the farmer's market during the winter seasons. So you just have to build relationships um, in order to have that access to food during the colder climates. Yeah, we earlier this month actually did a workshop on um, cold weather crops and season extension. And so there are options if you're a community gardener, like buying a greenhouse, which can be kind of, again, cost prohibitive in some cases. But then there's also fleece row cover, which is a lot cheaper. And that's basically just this fleecy cloth. It looks like a bed sheet that you can stake over your plants. And I've seen people growing in, in New York City using row cover, even in the colder weather. I mean, we've gotten a lot of snow <laughs> this month, so that might that can definitely uh, prohibit you from growing then. But there are ways to keep things warmer. Um, yeah, and days are they can be pretty expensive. There might be ways, um, and even with food co-ops that are more like social justice oriented, that have sliding scale prices, which I've I've seen around in New York City as well here and there, and farmers markets. They do have local produce um, for, for Grow NYC. We run our green markets, not all of them, but a good number of them all throughout the winter. And that is possible because the farmers we work with, um, for the produce farmers we work with, have state-of-the-art ways of preserving their vegetables and fruits. So personal, like personally, I know it's not possible to eat 100% local like 365 days out of the year. And I think there's even been studies about that. Like if you eat from your farmer's market, how much of your diet can you really realistically get from it? So I think it, it's kind of a personal journey to see, you know, what you're able to do, what you like to do. And then why we love to grow from food scraps with this kind of workshop is because it, there's really no barrier to entry here. It's just a couple of things that you might have lying around and you at least get kind of this symbolic sense of growing growing your own things, which I think has a power in itself. Yeah, um, I was also going to say a great tip also is that when some of your favorite stuff is in season, that's usually when it's the cheapest. Um, the farmers are going to bring the price down. And so if you have the ability to at that time to purchase these things um, and store them, freeze them, can them, uh, find other ways to, you know, save the produce so that way in the winter months you can go back and be able to use that and you don't have to go out and buy extra food or go to the supermarket and buy tomatoes because you can tomatoes in the summer. Yeah, preserving food is like a whole another thing that would make an awesome workshop. I have some some herbs in my fridge right now that I keep meaning to, I, I want to do that thing where you cut them up and put them in an ice cube tray with olive oil, and then you can save your herbs and just use them one herb ice cube at a time. Oh, wow. I never heard of that. I thought you were going to say I've been meaning to take them out the fridge and hang them up to dry them. That's another way. <laughs> dry herbs on the side. <laughs> Yes, if you run out of freezer space, you could dry the herbs as well. Yeah, personal choice there. <laughs> yeah, so all of this is really just a really great way for us to stay intentional about what we're eating and how we're eating it and why we're eating it, right? Um, because it all matters. It, it's all connected. Um, so we could go to the next slide. And just regrowing your own food. Like I said, it's all connected. You know, you're reducing food waste, you're supplementing your own food, fewer trips to the store, a better relationship with food, you're having fun. Um, and like Laura said, this bullet point is not on there, but you are empowering yourself, right? I think a lot of us get a little scared when it comes to growing something. Maybe we don't know how to grow it. And so we're a little tensitive, like, well, maybe I shouldn't put the seed in the ground. So just put the seed in the ground. <laughs> yes. Um, we've 
also found these um, little experiments are awesome to do with students. If you are, you know, if you have students at home who are learning, um, or if you are an educator, these kinds of experiments are fun because you can just give them that huge long list. You have one out of these 50 items in your pantry. Most people will have some sort of dried bean lying around somewhere. And if you have that, then you know you can go ahead and start sprouting them. All right, so we are happy to take more questions from the audience. So we got a couple of questions um, during your presentation, um, some of which you've answered already, but going back to the seed planting, um, someone asked, I have an avocado plant and it grows three to four leaves at a time. They fall off and then new ones grow. And the same thing has happened three times. What am I doing wrong? Do you have any suggestions? That's interesting. I have not heard of them falling off and then coming back. But what I have heard helps is once you do have, um, I think three or four sets of leaves, so the pears, um, you actually want to, even though it might hurt your heart a little, cut it off, um, cut off, trim the top off about half halfway um, because that will encourage the avocado um, stem to grow stronger and sturdier and be a bit more of like a bushier shape rather than just a very thin spindly um, thing going up. But another thing to look out for is if the leaves are turning like yellow before they fall off, that might be because it's overwatered. Um, you could you so you could try cutting back on the watering, or test it with your finger, like stick half your finger into the side of the pot and make sure that it's dry um, before you water it. You, it always can help to put a little bit of uh, compost in there if you have any compost or diluted fertilizer, doesn't hurt every now and then, like once a month. And the other thing I've heard with avocados is you wanna make sure that the pit is still exposed a little bit above the soil. So for a lot of things, especially with seeds, we think let's bury it completely. But with, um, with avocados, you want a little bit of the pit to be coming above the surface. That's a great segue to the next two questions, um, which go into garlic planting. How deep should the garlic be planted? And do you know when the garlic bulb is ready? And how do you know when the garlic bulb is ready? Excuse me. Um, how deep it should be? I think two to four inches, I think, to be planted. Um, yeah, you want to look, it depends like how big the garlic clove is, but you, however big it is, you want to go at least like if it's an, an inch or two, you want to go an inch or two below the surface. Yeah. Um, and how you know when it's ready, well, the it will grow. You'll have the garlic scapes. You'll be able to harvest um, maybe two or three times uh, for the harvest, for the garlic scapes. Um, and then it'll kind of like dry up. It'll look like it's like it's dying, but it's not dying. <laughs> right? It'll look like it's like dry up and it's dying at the top, but it's not. Um, it's just ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the same thing goes with the potatoes, which is kind of funny. It's you know that they're ready when the green part of the plant just starts to, to turn brown and die. That's uh, basically the plant saying, take me now. <laughs> uh, the next question is, how did you get the ginger to sprout before planting? Do you have any that suggestions on sprouting? That was just a mistake, honestly. I don't know what happened. Um, it was just the perfect storm of conditions. I didn't, and that was actually one of my coworkers. She sent me that picture to show me how all of her garlic had sprouted. Um, that's an interesting picture. I'm gonna go back to that. Um, because I was actually surprised that hers started sprouting like this because Usually you'd want to use really fresh young ginger. And so the, the ginger is young when it doesn't have a papery skin yet. And you can see here, this does have that rough papery skin. Um, so I, 
maybe it was the humidity. So I would suggest putting a little bit of water in there and see what happens if it could start sprouting. It's usually humidity that will prompt it to start sprouting, but this is pretty unusual. Um, I would also, when we did a, a workshop uh, a year or two ago with Green Thumb, where we wanted to give out little pieces of ginger for people to grow at home, I went to one of the green markets. Um, there's a, a farmer there who, who does grow their own, they grow their own ginger um, uh, called Lonnie's Farm. And he was more than happy to give me a bunch of new ginger that already had sprouts on it. Mm. So if you can find someone who has that new ginger or who is already gardening it um, and, and get a little cutting from them, that'll put you off on the right foot, a little head start. Great, thank you. Uh, some other questions, there's a couple of questions about using the leaves, whether it's from the ginger or from a pineapple for tea. Um, they're interested in, in learning more about that and if whether or not you can do it, and if so, how? So I can speak to ginger leaves. You can make tea out of it, and it won't be as potent as the root, but you can definitely do it. And you would just harvest the leaves and just don't have to dry it out first. You just kind of pour really steaming, boiling water on top of it and let it steep for a good amount of time. Um, you could also just use the leaves in, in cooking. It'll give it like a little infusion of ginger. It just won't be as strong a flavor as the ginger rhizome. Um, Chantel, were you the one who found out about the pineapple pie? Yes, that you could make. heard of that. I have not <laughs> tried it yet. <laughs> I, have, I have not, honestly, I have not tried it. Um, but a lot of the people that I know, they're really like herb herb heads and they love um, anything with tea anything with oh natural healing properties the things you know um but i think it's the same thing i think you just steep it for a pretty long time and then you just drink it but uh, feel free to google correct me um, <laughs> we're not we're not the pineapple tea experts <laughs> i'm not <laughs> I think we have some, we have time for one or two more questions. Um. Oh, I did see a question about the, the carrot tops and like why you would do that. And um, the carrot tops actually make a really great pesto yeah. that you can make out of it. And then also like the beet greens, you could use that for like smoothies. It has really great vitamins and minerals in there, fiber, all that good stuff. So some of the stuff is not necessarily to um, directly like eat by itself. It's like an add-on. So we have a few questions about um, critters. So. One is, is related to indoor and one is related to outdoor gardening. So how can you protect your plants from pets, cats, dogs, lizards, et cetera, and critters, roaches, flies, ants in the home? And then um, the same question for outdoor gardening, keeping vermin, um, rodents away from them. Um, okay, IPM questions. So <laughs> uh, oh, I think- Do you wanna tell them what IPM stands for? <laughs> Yes, integrated um, pest management. And so that's just basically pest management without chemicals, um, home remedies, how we could figure it out without poisoning ourselves, essentially. Um, and so I think for pets, uh, pets don't really bother plants too much, I don't think. Um, okay, so I'm the cat owner here, and I will tell you <laughs> that has definitely been a pest to our house plants. Um, for some reason, she likes to go in and like literally dig them up out of their pots. So for cats and dogs, what I would recommend is go to ASPC website. They have a whole list of which plants are safe for cats and dogs and maybe lizards. I don't know. And which ones are uh, like toxic versus safe. So I would recommend just only having the safe pet safe plants around. Um, and then if you do have any other kinds, just keep them out of reach of, of the pets. So like I have um, a pothos plant, which is toxic for cats. So I have it hanging from my window um, out of her reach. So that's one thing for indoor pets. 
Uh, yeah, I think I think the only reason why I said that we had a um we had a cat on the farm, and she didn't really bother any of the vegetables. But I think it's just because we fed her vegetables as well, and so she was happy, and she <laughs> didn't. Also, want to... it depends on the pet. Yes. <laughs> I think for other pests, um, it gets a little tricky depending um, on what you're trying to grow. Uh, flies and, and roaches and the other stuff, um, simple traps will work. Um, and then also if you notice the sticky traps. Yeah, the little sticky traps that you could get. You could put them directly on the plant, like on the soil of the plant, and it just catches everything that comes in contact with it. Um, so that could be a great way for you to kind of mitigate some of the pests going on, going around. And for outdoors, it it it's a whole workshop that we did it's on the distance learning page. You can feel free to look at that workshop. It's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, one like catch all could be putting like netting, making netting or row cover over your plants for outdoor stuff. But it's kind of like each type of bug reacts um, differently. So in terms of treatments that you can make yourself at home and put on it, I think you got to check out Chantel's entire like 40 minute workshop on it. Um, <laughs> it. It does differ which kind of pest you're trying to get rid of. Where there's a will, there's a way. Yes. There's a couple of more questions that we'd like to, to fit in. One of them is um, regarding the containers that you've um, used for the food scraps. So I guess one of the pictures um, had a milk, a milk crate. And the, the question is just for suggestions on what kind of containers and where you can get them from, whether they're purchased or, you know, you've, you've mentioned um, recycling or repurposing mm -hmm. yeah. some so you could talk about just some suggestions for for vessels yeah this milk crate works great because it is very deep um so whatever type of plant you're growing with especially root vegetables you want to make sure it has at least about a foot of depth so milk crates work great for that you can even stack them on top of each other if you want to reach it a little easier to, to do gardening that's a bit elevated. So we love to use milk crates. They're pretty inexpensive or you could find them for free somewhere. Um, and what you can see is we lined the inside of the milk crates with landscape fabric so that the soil wouldn't get all over our office because we would be in trouble if that happened. Um, a really great low cost option for a deep container is five gallon buckets. And you can even just go to like if you, if you know someone at your restaurant, like local restaurant, ask them if they have any, um, or a lot, those you can kind of source for free or very low cost. Yeah, I was thinking you could even use like any type of bin, anything where you can easily like uh, be able to put a lining in it or put some type of like holes in it if it's too deep. Just, you know, um, you could really just repurpose anything that you have I know a lot of people, they use like uh, yogurt containers, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> shoes. Um, somebody was using a toilet to grow stuff out of. <laughs> it was like, it was an old toilet. It wasn't a, it was an old toilet <laughs> that was sitting there. They cleaned it out and they put soil in and they were growing stuff out of it. I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying you could repurpose anything. Yeah, the thing when you're repurposing, um, just make sure that it has some sort of drainage. You want to make sure that water doesn't it doesn't get waterlogged at the bottom. Um, there's a good question about arrow gardens um, and using an arrow garden for growing scraps. Uh, do you have any experience with arrow gardens? Would you recommend them? I don't have any experience with arrow gardens. Actually, is that like with just growing with air, like air plants? <laughs> I, um, I'm not sure myself. I, I was imagining like a hydroponic kind of situation. Maybe the person aeropon can aeropon clarify in the chat. In the chat. Yeah, but, um, they, they have like a little system and you could set it up in your house and, and grow stuff or whatever. But I, I haven't used it and I can't, I can't in, in good conscience recommend it. But if you want to try and experiment, like me and Laura said, everything is an experiment. So feel free to experiment and then Hit us up and let us know if you work. <laughs> and I think we can get one more question in, and it's about I I think 
maybe somewhere along the way, you talked about um, growing the scallions or the, the green onions in the refrigerator. And so the question is, can you grow scraps in the refrigerator or is it too cold, um, too cold of a condition to grow? Yeah, that was a, that's a good question. And I've found uh, the scallions work really well in the fridge for some reason. And I kind of like to have them out of the way. So I keep my scallions in the fridge um, and the cold doesn't seem to inhibit their growth. If you're, same thing with like carrots and celery and all of that kind of stuff. Those are pretty cold tolerant plants already. So I've not had any trouble. They seem to grow really well and be, be happy in there even though there's also no sunlight. Um, but you could, if you wanted to keep them out on your windowsill, you could do that as well. Um, it'll catch a few more rays there. If I'm doing it with um, like herb cuttings or propagating herbs, that those I do keep out of the fridge on the windowsill at room temperature because herbs, especially, you know, basil, cilantro, mint, those are, well, mint could probably go in the fridge, but the other herbs are more sensitive to the cold. Thank you so much, Chantelle and Laura. That brings us to the end of our questions.